Hi everyone. In this video, I will be demonstrating how you can model longitudinal data with a continuous outcome using generalized estimating equations. And we are going to be working with our studio uh, during this uh, demonstration. So uh, the example that we're working from uh, is adapted from Kwai's article from 2007, uh, where he analyzed the same data uh, using Stata. So there's no analogous version uh, for our studio. So I thought this would be a good um, place to pivot from. So uh, before I get started, I do want to mention that underneath the video description, you'll find a link to the data set that we're going to be using in this presentation. Um, the data set is called NLS. Uh, work to. Uh, it is uh, basically a CS or saved in a CSV file. So we'll be importing that file into our studio before we carry out our analysis. Uh, so you can download a copy of the data to follow along. Uh, you will also find um, a, uh, a link to a knitted R markdown file that I've created. Basically, it's in the form of a PDF file. Uh, that is what you see on your screen right now. So you can download that. Uh, there's a lot of um, detail that I'm going to be covering throughout this presentation that's in here. But then there's also some additional details um, that I'm not covering in the presentation that will be there as well. So uh, be sure to check that out. Uh, the last I want to note that uh, you'll find a link to the original article. Um, if you go to this link right here underneath the website, it'll take you to the Sage website. And you can download a copy of the article or you can open it up uh, using a little PDF button right there. And this is the article. So it's QIC program and model selection in GEE analysis. Uh, and again, this was published in 2007 uh, with the SAGE, uh, with uh, the Stata Journal. So let's briefly talk about the data. Uh, basically, it comes from the National Longitudinal Survey of Labor Market Experience. Um, and uh, the sample contains um, women aged 14 to 26 years of age uh, who have completed their education. And uh, the outcome variable in our analysis will be the natural log of wage. So basically, uh, the natural log of a woman's wage at a given measurement occasion. The year variable indicates the year in which the data were collected. The predictors in our model will be grade, that is the current grade that has been completed. It ranges from 0 to 18. Um, the age of survey respondent and a binary indicator, uh, which is called South, uh, basically indicating whether a respondent came from the South or otherwise. Uh, I will mention, too, that the grade variable really is just uh, looks like it's just a proxy for uh, education level. I will mention, too, that by all appearances, the data looks like it was um, collected during the um, 1960s and 1970s. So the first thing that we want to do is to read in the data. Um, you can either use uh, syntax or you can uh, just use the import wizard uh, in our studio. Um, you'll see uh, on the, the screen right here, uh, basically this is uh, the code for reading in a CSV file. Uh, you've got read.csv, and uh, basically this is the path to the actual file on my computer. So uh, if you're going to use that, you'll need to uh, make sure that you correctly specified the path. Um, and what's going on is that we're reading that file um, uh, into our studio, and then it's creating a new uh, object, uh, basically a data frame called NLS Work 2. Um, so I'm not going to actually walk you through that part. We're just going to go ahead and import the data using the wizard over here just by going uh, under our studio. Um, and before we actually do the import wizard, we want to um, specify the path to the folder on our computer that contains our data set. So I'm going to go to session right here, go to set working directory, and then choose directory. And um, you can see I've got a number of different um, uh, folders uh, on my computer. And i uh, just kind of clicked through uh, a couple of them uh, and then found uh, this is the folder that actually contains my data set right there. Uh, and so we're just leaving this um, set uh, for that particular folder. Um, the new folder, just ignore that. That's just um, just um, trash. <laughs> so, so let's go ahead and click on open right here. And um, so now we're pointing to the folder on my computer that has the data set. Now we'll go to file, import data set, 
from text uh, base right here. If you're using a different file format, obviously you've got Excel, SPSS, there's Stata down here. Uh, but we're, uh, again, we're just going to click on from text right here and select the um, data set. So this is the CSV file, NLS Work 2. We'll click on open. You'll notice that uh, down here it says NA uh, dot strings at the uh, and you'll see it says set up for NA. So basically, if there's missing data, uh, it's going to register in our studio as NA. So we'll click on uh, import to import our data. And um, so you can see just kind of visually the, the data set in the upper pane. Uh, I will mention too that if we kind of, uh, kind of move this up just a bit, go down to the lower panel, you'll see that um, we've got NLS work two right there. This is the name of the data frame after reading the data in, and there's that read.csv um, function I was telling you about. And uh, this was actually pointed to a different folder than you see act actually in um, the R markdown file. But that's just basically what's happening. So we have the data uh, read into R Studio, and now we can uh, start to process it. So the next thing that we want to do is um, we're going to go to File, go to New File, and then to our script. So we'll click on that. And in this section uh, up here in the upper pane, this is where we're going to be typing in our code. And we can run it uh, you know, in, in separate sections or as a batch. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through and type in and show you what happens as we go along. So what we need to do at this point is we need to load the relevant packages for our analysis. So the main package for performing the GEE analysis is GPAC or GEE pack. So I'm going to type in library and inside parenthesis, we're going to type in GEE pack and um, We'll uh, go to the next line, and then I'm just going to go ahead and type in uh, library, and we're going to add in a couple of other, load a couple of other packages just for uh, screening the data. So I'm just going to type in SJMISC, uh, and there's a function associated with that that we're going to be uh, using. It's the uh, FRQ function. I'm just going to type a little comment right here with the pound sign FRQ um, um, function. That's just indicating the function right there. And then library, and then we'll refer to the psych package. So psych, and then we're going to be using the describe function right there. So just so you know, uh, the little pound sign just is indicating a comment. And then th that's just my little comment for each of those. Just remind us what functions are associated with that. I'll also mention up here that uh, I'll just kind of add in a little comment right here. And the function that we'll be using uh, for our GEE uh, analysis is uh, GEE GLM. And so that's it right there. So let's go ahead and highlight all of these. We'll click on run. And now the packages are loaded. And so now we can use the functions associated with those packages. Um, so at this point, what we're going to do is just take a look at the uh, data that's been imported. So I'm going to first start out with the structure function. So str, then we'll type in nls work2. So <clears throat> keep in mind, that's the name of the data frame. We've read the data into uh, RStudio. That's the name of the data frame that contains our data. So um, we'll, we'll uh, type in str for, uh, that's our structure function. I'm going to go ahead and type in describe and uh, NLS work too. And uh, we'll go ahead and, and create, uh, we're, we're just going to read uh, data on a subset of our uh, variables. So uh, in this particular case, I'm going to use the C function. Uh, and inside parenthesis, we're going to type the names of the variables that we want to uh, get descriptives on. So we can type in uh, LS, excuse me, uh, LN underscore wage, um, then We'll type in uh, age. Keep in mind that these are in um, quotation marks. Then grade. And then south right here. OK. And then what we'll do is we will uh, go down and we'll just uh, type in FRQ right here. Excuse me, FRQ. And then we're going to uh, type in NLS work to dollar sign and then south. So. Uh, let's go ahead and highlight all of these and run and just kind of take a look at them. All right. So when we do this, you'll notice that we've got 
uh, some general information about our data set. So the str function, the structure function, I didn't specify any particular variables. So you'll notice that we've got the names for all the variables in our data frame that are given. So you got ID code, year, birth year, age, race, MSP, uh, you know, south down here and so forth. You've got in this uh, second column, you've got a description of the variable in terms of its characteristics. So you have a number of in integer variables and then you've got uh, some numeric variables um, that are uh, also provided. Um, and then you've got, um, you know, just some of the observations. You'll notice that as we kind of scroll down, you've got um, some NAs on some of these variables. The NA is just registering uh, missing values for uh, those cases where the NA is observed. So we do have some NAs in our data set um, to, to be mindful of so that we, in other words, we have some missing data. So we'll scroll down. And when we use the describe function right here, um, if we had just typed in describe and then NS, NLS work two and in parenthesis and none of the other stuff, we would have gotten descriptions of all the variables in the data frame. So basically all of these variables that you see right here, uh, but you can see there's a lot of them and there's more than we're going to be using in our analysis. So I just wanted to select a subset of them uh, to uh, look at descriptives on. So in other words, we have the mean standard deviations uh, and so forth, as well as the sample sizes associated with each of those uh, variables. So what we did is we used um, our um, bracket right here and inside use the uh, C uh, function and uh, inside the parenthesis here, we are referring to just those variables that we want to take a look at. So those variables are enclosed in quotation marks and separated by commas. We had to uh, close out the C function right here uh, with the N parenthesis, then close out uh, this bracket right here for NSL or NLS work too. And then we had to close out the total describe function right there with an in parenthesis that you see right there. Uh, for the uh, frequency function, which was associated with that uh, SJMISC package, uh, I've referred to the, um, the data frame right here with a dollar sign and then the name of a variable, which we're using, uh, we're, we're just selected south. So uh, basically this just selects the south variable to get frequency data on. So that's all that's going on. So as we're looking at, uh, first off with the describe function right here for our subset of variables, you'll see that in terms of the sample sizes, the ends, you can see that they vary, which is telling us basically that there are, um, that there's uh, gonna be missing values for some of these variables in the, uh, in the, the data set because the sample sizes are uh, varying. So that's uh, something to kind of keep in mind. There's missing values. And then if we scroll down, you'll see that using that uh, frequency function down here uh, with the south variable, you'll see that we've got, there's our values for the south variable, zero and one. And then you'll notice that we've got NA indicating uh, the uh, missing values. And we have eight uh, cases with missing values on that particular variable. So we do have missing values on uh, this subset of variables. Now, the reason why this is so important, uh, or a reason why this is uh, important, is because the GEE GLM function is, is, will not work if we have missing values on the variables that we are analyzing. So uh, that creates a problem then. We have a data set where we have uh, missing values and we have a function uh, that will not tolerate uh, missing values. So one thing that we can do is we can create a new data frame and uh, basically uh, exclude those cases that have missing values on the variables that we're gonna be analyzing. So at this point, what I wanna do is um, kind of adopt a two-step strategy. The first step uh, is that we're going to create a new data frame that contains only a sub th this subset that we're referring to. So I'm gonna go down uh, to another line right here and I'm gonna uh, create a new data frame, the name of a new data frame. I'm gonna call it new DF2. And then uh, what we'll do is we are going to uh, type in an arrow. That's just basically a less than sign followed by a hyphen. And then we're gonna use the subset function. So I'll type in subset. And uh, inside uh, the parenthesis here, we're gonna refer to the name of our original data frame, which is NLS work two. 
then we're going to type comma, and then we're going to uh, type select. Okay, so now we're going to be selecting the variables that we want to include in this new data frame that we're calling new DF2. So I'll type in an equal sign, and then we're going to use the C function. And uh, inside uh, the parenthesis, we're going to type in the names of our variables. Now, one of the things that we did not request previously when we uh, uh, when we uh, used the describe function was ID code. And ID code, uh, that's basically our subject identifier. And uh, we want to include that in our data frame as well. So I'm going to type uh, inside uh, parenthesis here, and we have uh, enclosed in, in the quotation marks, ID code. So that's one of the variables that's in our data frame. If we go, we can kind of go up here and just take a quick look. This is the variable I'm talking about in the first column. So uh, we have ID code. We're going to type a comma and then the names of the uh, variables that we referred to above. So we're going to type in LN underscore wage, then uh, age, comma. Uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and just go to the next line. We'll type in uh, grade and then south right there. OK, so at this point, um, we have the variables that we want to include in our new data frame uh, identified. And uh, by the way, the last thing that we're going to do is uh, outside this little parenthesis here, we'll type in, we'll go ahead and type in drop and set that equal to false. That's actually the default uh, for this uh, function anyway, but it's OK. So now what we'll do is we will uh, highlight all of this and click on run. And so we have a new data frame that's been created and we can take a look at our data frame. I'll just uh, type in head then type inside the parenthesis new DF2 so the, that we can take a look at that data frame. We'll click on run right here. And so you can see that we have ID code, uh, the natural log of wage, age, grade, and south. So those are the variables that we wanted to include. Now, if we use our uh, describe function as before, in this case, uh, we already have just a subset. So we can just refer to the new DF2 uh, data frame right there highlight it, click on run. So you can see that the ends for our variable still vary. Okay, so obviously we don't have uh, complete data on all of these variables uh, that you see right here. And again, if we use the uh, FRQ function, uh, we'll just refer to new DF2 dollar sign south right here. You can see once again, we highlight this and run it, that uh, we have eight cases with missing values. So, so far we have a subset of the original data set, but we haven't gotten rid of the problem of the missing values. So now what we're going to use is an another function uh, that's called na.omit. And basically what that function will do is it will eliminate all cases from the data set uh, that contain missing values on any of those variables. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and type in new. DF2. So we're referring back to our original data frame, but we have an arrow pointing to it. And we're going to apply this function, uh, which is na.omit. And inside parenthesis, we'll refer to the data frame again. So what's happening is that this right here is going to use the omit, the na.omit function to remove um, uh, cases from our original data frame. Uh, our, our newest version of the data frame, uh, and then save that to uh, basically overwrite the data frame um, so that now there will be no missing values. So we'll go ahead and highlight this and click on run. And so when we take a look at our data now, we can just uh, go ahead and we'll just go ahead and use the describe function again, new DF2 and uh, FRQ, new DF2 dollar sign south right here. And you can see that uh, the ends for all of our variables are exactly the same. And you can see down below the NAs for the south variable, zero. So now we have a complete data set and we are ready to proceed with carrying out our uh, GEE analysis. So at this point, what I want to do is to uh, specify uh, the GE model. 
and uh, say and basically run the analysis and save that analysis to an object. I'm going to call this object M1, just just my uh, naming for model one. We'll type in an arrow and we'll type in next GEE GLM. So that's the GEE GLM function associated with the GPAC uh, package. So inside the parenthesis, we need to specify. First off, we need to specify the model. Uh, basically, we specify the, the name of the outcome variable. Uh, we follow that with a tilde and then the names of the uh, predictor variables, all separated by plus signs. So I'm going to type in ln underscore wage, uh, then tilde, and then we'll type in age plus grade plus south, then comma. And then we're going to uh, refer to the, uh, we're going to um, uh, type in ID. So this is the cluster identifier, or uh, in the case of our longitudinal data, our uh, subject identifier. So we'll type in uh, equals, and then we'll type in the name of our identifier, which is ID code. So I'll type in ID code uh, there, and then follow that up uh, with a comma. So I'm actually going to go ahead and proceed on the next line just to give us a little bit more room. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to type in C-O-R-S-T-R. So this is, a, this, is, this is basically referring to a working correlation uh, structure. So when you're running your GE analysis, you're going to have to ha make an assumption about um, the uh, correlations among uh, the um, uh, the observations, uh, keeping in mind that you know in the context of a longitudinal uh, design, the expectation would be that there would be some correlation between observations uh, within uh, each individual subject. So C O R S T R is referring to the working correlation structure that you are assuming uh, from the outset. And uh, I kind of discuss uh, the working correlation structure and I give you some sites and so forth in that R markdown file that I was referring to earlier. So be sure to check that out. So I'm gonna type in equals, and then we're gonna go ahead and just use um, exchangeable. So I'm gonna type in ex exchangeable right there. Uh, and this has to be inside quotation marks. So everything else, was not in quotation marks, we have to have our working correlation structure uh, argument inside quotation marks. So then we'll type in a comma, and then we'll type in uh, data and set that equal to new DF2. That's our data frame. So at this point, uh, we would be running the analysis uh, and then saving it to an object called M1. And then if we want to uh, look at all of our regression results, then we can use the summary function. We'll type in summary M1 right there. So we'll highlight all of this and click on run. And now we've generated our output. So you can see we've got, uh, there's our model and all the, the specifications up to this point. We have our uh, regression coefficients. These are the estimates, the standard errors. You can see that we have wall tests and then uh, the p-values associated with each uh, coefficient. And then you can see that Really, all of our coefficients are uh, in are statistically significant uh, at uh, p less than 0 0.001. So you can see right here that uh, basically age uh, is a positive predictor of wage, um, grade is a positive predictor, and then whether a person comes from the south. If uh, south was coded zero for otherwise and one for south, so basically, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, those folks who tend to be uh, from the South um, are generally predicted on average to be lower in their wage. So um, at any rate, there's just some additional information of, uh, associated with our analysis that we're not really going to get into. So at this point, that's basically all there is to it in terms of running the analysis um, or the basic analysis. And um, unfortunately, one of the, the limitations of running GEE is that you don't have any measures of overall model fit. You're basically just estimating the parameters in the model and then carrying out significance tests of them, but you can't really look at the overall fit of the model. So that might be disconcerting to some folks, um, but that's just kind of the way it is. Um, it is possible to kind of evaluate a model in relation to other models. Um, using an index that's called the uh, quasi um, 
the quasi likelihood under independence uh, criterion or QIC. And uh, that was actually uh, the main gist of this article right here that I was referring to earlier. Uh, the, uh, the author, uh, James Kwai, uh, basically uh, what he did was he kind of came up with a new package for uh, Stata where essentially uh, it would allow the generation of the QIC for different models and then facilitate model comparisons. So what he did uh, suggest though, um, as a strategy um, is to start out uh, by, um, you know, basically if you wanna test a model that contains different sets of predictors and decide on which subset is the best uh, subset to work from, if that's how you wanna pr uh, proceed, uh, then uh, you would first need to, um, if, you know, test out uh, the model in terms of various working correlation matrices. Um, and uh, basically make a decision about which working correlation matrix you should go with. Um, and then once that's done, then proceed to uh, comparing models on uh, the QIC in terms of different um, uh, uh, sets of, of uh, predictors and so forth. So what I wanted to do next is just kind of proceed in that fashion, just to walk you through this. Um, this might be considered uh, by some to be overkill, but um, I still wanted to provide this uh, for you. And there's some discussion of this in uh, that R markdown file that I was telling you about. So the first thing that we're gonna do is um, we can generate a QIC uh, for our current model. Uh, I'm just gonna type in QIC. This is also a function associated with GE PAC. Uh, and uh, inside this, we're gonna type in M1. That's referring to our model that we just ran. So if I click on you know, highlight this and click on run, uh, you can see that I get a QIC value right there, which is uh, 2221.078. So by itself, it doesn't really tell us anything, uh, but in relation, if we kind of run several, several different models where we uh, vary the uh, working correlation structure, uh, then we can get an idea of what the QICs are for each of those, and then evaluate each model in terms of that working correlation structure to decide which is the best one uh, to go with moving forward. And generally speaking, the QIC uh, uh, associated with the model, the lowest QIC associated with the model uh, indicates the preferred model. So now what we'll do is um, I'm actually going to kind of cheat a little bit. I'm going to copy this uh, and then uh, go down here and we'll create a model too and uh, change the working correlation structure. So why retype that if we don't have to, right? So another, um, you know, in the context of longitudinal data of, uh, 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 one a reasonable assumption about uh, the uh, correlations among the um, observations is that they follow an autoregressive one structure. So we'll type in AR1 right there. Uh, so this is a, a another type of working correlation matrix. And then uh, we'll also type in QIC and then M2 right here. So I'll highlight both of these and click on run. And so now we've generated our other model. I didn't I didn't request uh, you know all of the model information for model two. I just requested the QIC for model two, which is uh, 2232.05. And you can see that that number uh, is actually um, going to be uh, it's uh, actually greater than uh, the number that we had uh, previously, which was uh, 2221. So of these two, then, the preferred uh, working correlation structure would be uh, for the exchangeable uh, structure. So then what we'll do is we'll go down, we'll do another one. We'll um, copy this again. And we'll call this model, we'll call this model three. And then from there, uh, we will use the independence working uh, correlation uh, structure. So basically, the independence structure just basically assumes that there's no correlation uh, among the um, uh, observations over time. So in this particular case, uh, we can uh, generate that. I'll use the QIC function. We'll refer to model three right there. We'll highlight this, run it. 
And so now for this one, uh, strangely enough, it's 2,209. That's less than the QIC for the previous two models. So of the three models at this point, the preferred model is uh, going to be model three, which assumes a working correlation structure. And just keep in mind too that um, that uh, that uh, Kai and his uh, article, you know, he did uh, make the men make mention that um, again of you know testing these different working correlation matrices. That this is a preliminary to testing out different models or comparing different models uh, with respect to their um, the the predictor variables. So just kind of keep that in mind. I think I've already articulated that, but I wanted to reiterate it. All right, so that's uh, for model three. Then we'll do uh, one more. We'll in this particular case, we'll um, I'll just kind of highlight all of this, copy it, and we'll paste those in. We'll call this one model four. Uh, another type of working correlation uh, matrix that we could use is called unstructured, and so that will be our model four right there. And we'll highlight this and click on run. And so you can see that this number also is greater than our model three. So basically model three, um, you know, worked out pretty pretty well in relation to the other models in terms of the wor working correlation uh, matrix, which is kind of strange because uh, basically model three is assuming uh, that uh, we don't have correlations uh, over time um, but, uh, for the observation. So that is a, kind of an unusual occurrence, but that is actually what uh, is reported by uh, Kwai in uh, the article. Okay, so now that we've landed on that particular working uh, correlation structure, and then we can compare different uh, uh, different models containing subsets of the original set of variables. Oh yeah, I, I remember now. One of the things that uh, is going to be important is that when you are um, you know, testing these models out in terms of the working correlation structure, um, you you will want to use the kind of the full model uh, when doing this. So um, so start out with all the variables that are included uh, in the analysis, and then uh, you know once you've decided on that, then you can go back and look at subsets of variables associated with um, um, your 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 um, your analysis. So now what we'll do is we will uh, proceed to testing some of those um, subsets of variables. So I'm going to go back to the article right here just to kind of show you what uh, what was done. We'll kind of scroll down here. Um, there's example one. That's the one we're looking at. So uh, basically it gives you kind of a table right here of different models. So you can see right here uh, the, the working correlation structure. There's independent uh, this was the QIC that we generated just a second ago. There's exchangeable. There's the um, and so notice that the complete set of predictors is included in each one of these where we're uh, comparing these different working correlation structures. Uh, there were actually a couple of other ones that we did not use in our uh, demonstration here. So then once we've landed. Uh, right here on this one, then what we want to do is, or we can do, is we can test the, the uh, models containing different subsets. So these are all independent correlation structures right here. And you can see there's a model with age in it, a model with grade in, a model with south, then a model with age and grade, age and south, and then uh, then grade and south. So, and then we also have the, the up here, we have the full model with all three predictors uh, that are included. So at this point, we're going to take model three right here. I'm going to copy it and uh, we'll go ahead and paste it in. And uh, I'm going to rename this. I'm going to call this model A and we'll just uh, include the age predictor. So keeping in mind that our working correlation structure uh, is independence right here. So that's the first model. And then we'll do a, a model B right here. Uh, that contains the grade predictor. So I'll just kind of get rid of these two variables here and leave grade in there. Uh, and then we'll do uh, model C uh, where in this particular case, we have uh, South in it. So these are all single predictor models uh, right there. And then we have the, the uh, two predictor models And uh, I just uh, paused for a second there and just went ahead and created the remaining models. So there we've got 
Um, there's model D right there with two predictors, model E with the two predictors, model F uh, with uh, two predictors right there. And then I went ahead and put model three in here once again, just to highlight that. So then you can see down below, I've also uh, used the QIC function right there, referring to model three, that's our full model. Then we have model A, model B, all the way to model F. So uh, just to kind of expedite things. So we'll go ahead and highlight all of this and click on run so that it runs everything. And so now we have our list of QICs uh, for each of the models. There's uh, for model uh, three right there is 2209, uh, then model A, 2685. So the preferred model is obviously model three relative to model A. Uh, the same goes for um, uh, model B, model C, and basically, all of the QICs uh, are higher uh, for models A through F than, uh, than, than our original model three. So that actually suggests that our three predictor model is a better fit uh, to the data. Uh, I will mention too that there's another index that's provided. It's uh, this QICU uh, that um, Kwai also um, discusses. And uh, this is not really appropriate for uh, deciding on the working correlation uh, matrix, but it is useful in the same context right here. It's just a simplified version of the QIC. Um, so you can see right here, though, that the Q QICU is also uh, smallest for uh, our full model. Um, Obviously, this is, you know, this may not be a strategy that you uh, find particularly appealing. It's just something that if you want to identify the kind of the best subset of predictors or whatever, then this might be an option for you. Uh, but the previous step where we were identifying the working correlation uh, structure, uh, where we compared different models, uh, like the AR1, the exchangeable, the independence and unstructured, uh, that would be relevant uh, even in the context of our basic modeling because uh, then you can kind of uh, decide on the working correlation structure and then uh, decide on, uh, and when you're reporting, then report on uh, the, the results so using that particular structure. So uh, that uh, pretty much wraps up this video presentation. Um, I know there was a lot that we covered right here. Hopefully you found it useful. Uh, I appreciate you watching and you guys have a great day.